Okay. Good morning, everybody. Hmm. All right. And so what I'd like to talk to you about today is a way we've opened up a new window into the universe. Now, astronomy is one of the oldest fields that we have, and for a pretty obvious reason, right? You can literally look up into the sky and see the fundamental building blocks of our field. You can see the sun and other planets and other stars. And with a nice enough telescope, you can even see other planets around other stars. And every time we've developed a new kind of telescope, a new way of looking out into the universe, it's helped to fundamentally change how we view the size and scope of the universe and how we view our own place inside the universe. As an example, uh, in 1609, Galileo used his newly developed telescope to observe uh, the planet Jupiter, and he noticed that there seemed to be little moons orbiting around the planet Jupiter. Now this led credence to the idea that maybe the Earth wasn't the center of the universe because suddenly there were other things out there in, in the sky that were not revolving around the Earth. Fast forward to 1920 when a young astronomer named Edwin Hubble uh, showed up at the Mount Wilson Observatory where they just finished commissioning the 100-inch Hooker Telescope, at the time the biggest telescope in the world. Now by the 1930s, Hubble had used that telescope to observe other galaxies beyond the Milky Way, and he noticed that those galaxies seemed to be moving away from us. So in one fell swoop, he managed to show that not only is the universe bigger than we thought it was to begin with, but it's getting bigger all the time. The universe is actually expanding. Now uh, move forward another 30 years, and you have Arno Pinzas and Robert Wilson, a couple of scientists working at Bell Labs um, on a new type of radio antenna. Now they switch the thing on and they immediately notice that there's this sort of low level noise, this low level humming coming from pretty much every part of the sky. At first they thought maybe it was a calibration error, there were some pigeons roosting in their telescope. But after checking all the knobs and switching, switches and you know, cleaning out as much pigeon crap as you can as a professional astronomer, they still couldn't get rid of this low level signal. Uh, it turns out they'd actually discovered what we today call the cosmic microwave background radiation literally the leftover afterglow from the Big Bang. Now each one of these stories has a common unifying thread. Astronomers develop a new type of telescope, make a fundamentally new observation about the universe, which changes the paradigm of astrophysics. It changes the kind of questions we can ask about the universe and our entire view on the subject of astronomy. Now, by their very nature, these sort of paradigm shifts are completely unpredictable. But I think we may have just started a new paradigm shift in astronomy, and it sounds a little something like this. That little click that you just heard in, this, in the middle there, if you didn't catch it, don't worry, we'll come back to it later, was the output, <laughs> that little 0.2 second thud, was the output of the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO, on September the 14th, 2015. Now that morning, LIGO observed gravitational waves from two black holes crashing into one another 1.3 billion light years away from Earth. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. It's that new paradigm shift that we've started into an entirely new field called gravitational wave astrophysics. But to do that, I have to take a step back almost exactly 100 years to 1915, when Albert Einstein first proposed his theory of general relativity. Now, general relativity was Einstein's answer to Newton's theory of gravity. In Sir Isaac Newton's idea, gravity was just some invisible strings that stretched across space and pulled pretty much every bit of mass towards every other bit of mass. Now in Einstein's view, he didn't like this a lot, so instead he got rid of the invisible strings entirely and said, what if space itself is responsible for the effect we call gravity? What if it's space that is actually responsible for the gravitational pull that we all feel? So in Einstein's view, what you have is you have the curvature of space itself that creates the effect of gravity. Um, if you put a mass out there in space, it's going to pull and bend space and time towards it. And anything else that happens to be hanging out nearby in space is going to get pulled and bent along with it. Um, I usually explain this in terms of an analogy with a trampoline. If I'm playing with a trampoline and I decide to throw a bowling ball into the center of it, um, the bowling ball right, is going to pull and warp the trampoline towards it. And if I try to roll something else along the surface, like uh, say a tennis ball, you know, I try to roll it in a straight line, but suddenly there is no straight line on the trampoline. Suddenly everything has to curve in the same direction as the trampoline. And that's gravity, according to, I, uh, according to Albert Einstein. Uh, John Wheeler used to sum it up a lot better than I could when he used to say that matter tells space how to curve and space tells matter how to move. Now people pretty 
pretty rapidly latched on to Einstein's new theory because it did a lot of impressive things. On the one hand, it explained everything that Newton's theory could. It explained why we fall down towards the center of the Earth and why the Earth is kept in orbit around the sun. It also helped explain a bunch of things that we'd observed for a while but never been able to fully explain, like, for instance, why the, why the orbit of the planet Mercury seems to change over several hundred years, or why starlight that passes right next to the sun seems to bend in the exact way that it does. But in addition, Einstein's theory of relativity seemed to predict a bunch of things that we'd never actually conceptualized of before. On the one hand, it seemed to say, if I had enough stuff in a small enough region of space, if I could actually compact matter down close enough to a single point, it would actually fall into a gravitational well so, so deep that not even light could escape. Nowadays, we call these black holes. But it had an even stranger prediction. It seemed to suggest that if I sped this up and I had two objects orbiting around one another fast enough, I might actually get waves or ripples in the fabric of space itself. And so if you go back to the trampoline analogy, imagine now I have two bowling balls going around one another inside the trampoline. They're gonna actually create ripples in the surface, right? And if you're sitting on the edge of the trampoline, you're gonna be able to feel those ripples as they reach the edge of the trampoline. And it turns out Einstein's theory suggests that the same thing happens in space. If I have two objects orbiting around one another, like two black holes, they'll actually create transverse waves in space-time that propagate outwards, and it will eventually even pass by us here on Earth. Now, when one of those waves passes through the Earth, it basically causes the distance in space itself to change a very tiny bit. If a wave were to pass through my hands here, it would cause the measured distance between my hands to very, very slightly breathe in and out. And that brings us back to LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. At its core, LIGO is the most precise ruler we've ever built. It's comprised of two instruments, one up in the deserts of Hanford, Washington, and one down in the swamps near Livingston, Louisiana. And what it is, is basically you have this four kilometer long arm out here in the desert. And at each end of those arms is a mirror that bounces a laser back and forth along this four kilometer long tube. And when that happens, because we know exactly how far that distance is, when a wave passes through the Earth, it causes that distance between those two mirrors to change very, very slightly. And we can then read off that fractional change in distance um, by the laser light that comes out of the end right here. Now, I've, I've made this sound pretty easy, but keep in mind that the distances that we're trying to measure here, that LIGO is trying to measure, is roughly equivalent to a thousandth the diameter of a proton. This is the most precise distance measurement that humanity has ever managed. I mean, there's a reason that it took this a thousand scientists over a billion dollars and 15 years to actually make this a reality. But when they did, when they finally turned it on, within two days, they managed to detect the signal that I played earlier. I'm gonna play it again here, but this time I'm gonna actually show the raw output from the Washington and Louisiana sites as it plays through both the audio and signal. And so that 0.2 seconds is the gravitational wave emitted by two black holes crashing into one another 1.3 billion light years away from Earth. In that 0.2 seconds, LIGO managed to finally prove that we can actually detect gravitational waves. Now, in Einstein's time, he couldn't have actually told you what this would have looked like. It turns out it's actually exceedingly difficult, bordering on impossible, to write down the equations for two black holes moving around one another. But today, we have the advantage of modern supercomputers that actually allow us to solve Einstein's equations um, basically just by turning the crank on the computer. So what I'm gonna show now is a simulation that I've stolen from a Caltech-Cornell collaboration, because if you're gonna steal, you might as well steal from Caltech. And it shows, <laughs> and it shows what this system would have looked like 1.3 billion light years away, 1.3 billion years ago, if we'd been sitting basically right in front of it. And I can't stress how fantastic this is. This entire simulation is based on Einstein's 100-year-old theory. And the detection that, we, that LIGO got in that 0.2 seconds matched 100% with Einstein's prediction. I should also point out, by the way, that this movie um, is actually significantly slowed down. By the time these black holes merged, they were actually moving at approximately 50% the speed of light. 
And the gravitational waves emitted by that merger in that 0.2 seconds was the most powerful and energetic event that we have ever witnessed as a species. Um, to put it in perspective, if that power in gravitational waves had been radiated in light instead, it would have briefly outshone every star in the known universe by a factor of 50. This thing was phenomenally powerful. And so, as myself, as an astrophysicist that works on black holes, that works on binary black holes, and works on gravitational waves, this was incredibly exciting when LIGO announced this. Um, our entire community basically lost it for about a week. Um, <laughs> But then, after we got over our initial euphoria and congratulating all of our LIGO colleagues, um, there was sort of a feeling left over of, wait, what? Because it turns out that if you'd asked astronomers um, five or 10 years ago what they thought LIGO's first binary black hole source would have been, nobody would have said something that looked like this. Most people would have said, oh, you might get a black hole that's like five times the mass of the sun, or maybe 10 times the mass of the sun. You know, big by human standards, but relatively puny by black hole standards. These guys, on the other hand, were 29 and 36 times the mass of the sun, bigger than any what are called stellar mass black holes that we'd observed up till this point. So after that was announced, there was sort of a feeling of, well, who ordered that? Where did this come from? <laughs> and it turns out, on the one hand, we kind of know theoretically where these kind of black holes come from. To get a black hole, say in that five or 10 times the mass of the sun range, what you need to do is start off with a massive star, almost 100 times the mass of our sun. And as you evolve it forward in time, that star is gonna burn through the nuclear fuel in its core. It's gonna slowly burn through that fuel and expand as it does until eventually the star uses up its available nuclear fuel in the center, expands to a massive size as a giant star before exploding in a supernova which leaves behind a compact object in the center, in this case, a compact black hole. Now, we see this happen on a fairly regular basis. We see plenty of supernova from here on Earth, and we see the black holes that they leave behind in our own galaxy. But again, all of those black holes are like five or 10 times the mass of the sun. So where do you get these big honking, 30 solar mass heavy black holes? It turns out what you need is a star that has a fundamentally different chemical composition than the kind of stars that we see um, either our own sun or other nearby stars. You need a star that is almost entirely comprised of hydrogen and helium. None of this heavier stuff like carbon or oxygen or iron. You basically need what we call very low metal and usually pretty old stars. So the question is, where do you find big collections of low metal stars just hanging out in the local universe? And so if I look out into the, into the universe, this is a picture of the Milky Way. You can see you know, a bunch of stars, a large conglomeration of stars in the center. But if I zoom in on one of these points, you can actually see it's a little more complicated than it appears at first. I'm zooming in on an object called M22, which is what's called a globular cluster. It's an old collection of stars, nearly 12 billion years old. It's maybe about 100,000 to 200,000 stars held together by their own gravity. Now these stars, because they're a lot older and because they came from a time when there was less metals in the universe, all are roughly have the exact chemical composition that you would need to actually produce the kind of black holes that LIGO just saw. And that in our galaxy alone, there's maybe about 200 or so of these globular clusters. We think there's a few hiding behind the gas in the center of the Milky Way there. But that's a rough estimate. I'm gonna zoom in now on another one of them called 47 Tuck, which is thought to be comprised of over a million stars. This is one of the most beautiful globular clusters, by the way. And so we have these old collections of st stars, with the massive stars of which would have easily produced black holes heavy enough to explain what LIGO saw. And when those black holes formed, they would have been retained in the cluster. They would have been held around by the gravity of these clusters. So then the final question is, can we somehow or another get those two black holes, the 20, 30, or even 40 solar mass black holes that these clusters produce into a binary to create gravitational waves like LIGO just detected? And it turns out the answer is yes. And this is what we do here at Northwestern. We run large computer simulations of globular clusters over their about 12 billion year lifetime. So we start with a large conglomeration of stars in the early universe, evolve it forward in time using our supercomputers, and then see what the output looks like. So I'm gonna play one of these simulations now. This is an extraction from one of my simulations where I've taken about 50 of the black holes and about 500 of the stars directly out of the core of one of these clusters and put it through uh, visualization. And what you can see is that right there in the center, 
you've got about 50 or so black holes just hanging out. They've essentially formed uh, a black hole only mosh pit right in the center of these clusters. And the reason that is, is because when you start off with all of these stars sort of mixed evenly, the black holes are going to be typically more massive than the average star in the cluster. And after a pretty short amount of time, they're going to sink down into the center. Um, kind of like if I stir up a glass of, of water with sand in it. After not too long, right, the sand is going to percolate down to the center and form a layer of sediment in the bottom. And once the black holes do that, they're suddenly in a very, very tight region of space. They're in a very, very dense configuration in the center of these clusters. To give you some perspective, the closest star to our sun is about four light years away. So in that box of space in our galaxy, there's like two objects. If you did that in a globular cluster and you drew that same four light year box, there would be roughly about a million stars and black holes right in that little region. And that's what leads to the crazy dynamics you're seeing here. Because now these black holes can come close enough together that they'll start to gravitationally interact. They'll start to you know, jostle each other off their orbits. They'll start to slingshot one another, occasionally even ejecting each other from the cluster in a somewhat violent display. And every once in a while, two of these black holes will wander close enough together that they'll actually catch each other right in their mutual orbit, and they'll form a binary black hole. So in essence, these globular clusters are gravitational wave factories. They produce, over their lifetimes, hundreds of these binary black holes and then kick them out into interstellar space to produce gravitational waves that LIGO can detect later. Now this is just one of the theories that scientists have been developing to try and explain where LIGO's first detection, where our first detection of gravitational waves came from. I should point out in the interest of fairness that there are at this point probably about 20 or 30 theories, all of which have come out suspiciously in the past month, um, trying to describe where this particular system came from. But that's kind of how a paradigm shift works. Because before, people weren't even asking the question. People weren't even thinking, where can I get 30 solar mass big honking black holes from? And how can I get them into a binary? But now that we've made this observation, people are starting to look at a fundamentally different aspect of astrophysics. And they're starting to ask questions that really would have been beyond the scope of the community, or just things that people wouldn't have really thought was worth their time beforehand. Now, what is this going to look like in five or 10 years? I have absolutely no idea. Paradigm shifts, by their very nature, are fundamentally unpredictable. But I should say that our models suggest that by the time they're finished upgrading the LIGO instrument, we'll be able to detect hundreds of merging black hole binaries every year. And that's just from globular clusters. That ignores every other source you'll get from every other region of space. So I have no idea what this is going to look like in five years, but I can say that it's going to be a very, very exciting time for astronomy. So stay tuned. <laughs>